أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الكريم وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنة إلى يوم الدين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome back brothers and sisters uh, to session number 40 of the discussion of Kitab al-Tawheed um, and uh, we looked last week at chapter 35 and apologies I couldn't I missed recording it last week so I, I have a kind of a um, uh, yeah, any request. If any of the brothers or sisters see that I'm not recording, I think you can make out the icon, which the circle, uh, the dot flashing, right? Uh, if if you can, if you notice that, please do let me know so I can at least start recording midway. So now you can see it flashing, hopefully, because I am recording, inshallah. So last week uh, we saw chapter 35. So part of Iman uh, in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to have patience, sabr, uh, in whatever Allah has decreed, the qadr of Allah. Naam? And it's also a pillar of Iman, as we know, it's, it's one of the pillars of our faith. Uh, we saw this ayat in, from Surah Taqabun, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مَا أَسَابَ مِمْ مُسِيبَةٍ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ وَمَنْ يُمِنْ بِاللَّهِ يَهْدِي خَلْبَهِ وَاللَّهُ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ عَلِيمٍ uh, so nothing, not no calamity, no no uh, distress, no um, uh, death, loss of life, loss of wealth, loss of job, anything happens except by the will of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Naam? And this is what of what we believe as as uh, the belief in Qadr, La hawla wa la quwwat illa billah. That not a leaf falls except by the will of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Naam? And Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala guides his heart and so on. We also saw this hadith from Sahih Muslim. From Abu Huraira radiallahu an, that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that the two things from his ummah or from the men which are equal to disbelief, uh, slandering one's lineage and, and wailing on the dead or lamenting on the dead, uh, crying out loud and, and displeased, being displeased with the qadr of Allah and so on and so forth. Because once you lament and cry and, and slap your cheeks and tear your hair and bangles and this and that, it means the person is displeased or doesn't agree with the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these are things we discussed last week and we also talked about certain tips on how we can practice these things in our lives and how we can be prepared when actually calamity befalls any one of us to have patience. The other hadith from Abdullah bin Masoud radiallahu an uh, from Sahih Bukhari Rasulullah said sallallahu alayhi wa he who slaps his cheeks, tears his clothes and follows the ways and traditions of jahiliyyah is not one of us, is not one of us. Again, it doesn't mean that the person has left Islam, no. Uh, when it said not, not one of us, it means uh, the grave danger, the grave, uh, the severity of those actions. You know, that you're, you're on the borderline, really. Yeah, that's what it means. <clears throat> and we saw these, uh, this hadith with, in two riwayat actually from uh, Tirmidhi, which is Hassan, uh, in terms of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If he wants good for his slave, he hastens his punishment in the world as, as a purification, right? And if he wants bad for his slave, he withholds his punishing him for the sins until he appears before him on Yom al Qiyamah. So that's what we saw. We sort of kind of started this chapter, but you know, we're going to relook at it again uh, because also I didn't record it last week. So chapter 36, which uh, Sheikh Muhammad Ibn Abdul Wahab, uh, he titles it Maja Fir uh, Riya. Uh, so what has been said, what is what comes regarding a Riya, rather the forbiddance of showing off. A Riya means to show off. Yeah. The first ayat. Uh, from Surah Kahf, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Rasulullah, say, Qul, innama ana bashru mithlukum, yuha ilayya annama ilahukum ilahu wahid. Faman kana yarju Allah, faman kana yarju liqa'a rabbihi, fal yamal amalan salih, fal yamal amalan salihan, wa la yushrik bi ibadati rabbihi ahad. Something which you recite commonly, at least on Yom al-Jumah, uh, the last ayat of Surah Kahf, where Allah is commanding Rasulullah to say, say that I'm only a man like you. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet of Allah, is a human being, a bashar, like, like you and me. He eats like us, he drinks like us, he marries like us, he sleeps like us. Huh? 
he, he, he answers the, the call like us and so on and so forth. He's a man like us. But what is the difference? Huh? Uh, he is receiving inspiration because it has been inspired to me that your Allah is one Allah. Ilahukum Ilahu Wahid is one or the, or the unique Ilah. So whoever hopes for the meeting with his Rabb, let him work righteousness and associate none as a partner in the worship with his Rabb. Nah. So what does this have to do with, with uh, flattery and show off? We saw this uh, few points. First of all, we talked about Ilah and we said, what is Ilah again? Who can tell me what is the meaning of Ilah? What is the meaning of Ilah? Hmm. La ilaha illallah. Brothers, sisters there. What is the meaning of Ilah? And the word Allah is derived from this. Al-Ilah. So what is Ilah? I don't want to be brothers and sisters are there. Worthy of worship. Mm, okay. Now, now, so anything or any object or any person, anything... Uh, which is worshipped, yeah, not necessarily worthy of worship, but it is worship, it is worshipped is ilah. So you can have a false ilah, obviously, and you can have a the right ilah, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, like, like some people take, like we said, uh, trees, cows, um, mountains, rocks as, as objects of worship, they take them as their ilah. This is the major problem, right? As the Quraysh, they took Laat, Wal Uzza, Wal Hubal as. Um, Ilah as, 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 as gods or worship, and they worship them besides Allah. So you may have a false Ilah and you may have a, the right Ilah, of course. The only one and, and the only right Ilah is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? This is a very important meaning which we need to keep in mind, brothers and sisters, because we say this in our Shahada, La ilaha illallah. Na? So we need to know what is Ilah. And uh, we also saw that this ayat in Surah Kahf 110. Is, is evidence of uh, the two conditions or the requirements which have to be uh, abided with or which have to be adhered to for any act of worship to be acceptable by Allah. So, wudu, ghusl, siyam, fasting, uh, salah, hajj, umrah, sadaqah, zakat, jihad, any act of worship to be acceptable to Allah has to fulfill two conditions. This ayat gives the evidence for that. One is that you do it only for the sake of Allah without any uh, shirk in it. Ikhlas. And two, it is done only in the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the plain truth we said about Rasulullah is that he was a human being. He was a human, human being. And the problem is with, 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 the, uh, with the kuffar and even the Quraysh of that day is that when, when Rasulullah was sent as a human being, they said, "How can we? How can we? How should, you know, how should we follow him? He's like he's like a human. He's like a human being like us. You know, he's like us, drinks like this. So why should why should you know how come he's become special and why should we follow him? He's like anybody else." And as Allah mentions in the Quran, meaning of which is, if we had sent angels as prophets, they would have said what? Huh? They would have said, "How can we follow the angels? They are angels." The way, uh, you know, above us, they don't have the similar characteristics and, and so on like us. So how do you expect us to follow angels? SubhanAllah. So you see, these people are people who, for whom Hidayah is sealed. The guidance is, is closed off. It's sealed off. So either way, it's, 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 a, it's a hopeless situation for them. But the wisdom, as the scholars say, with, with, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sending his prophets and messengers as, as human beings, is that they are good? They can be good role models, and and you can easily follow them, because they're human beings like you. And when they, and when they ask you to do something, it's easier to 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 relate to that and and to to uh, map yourself to that person and to follow him. It's much easier than if the if, if a prophet was an angel, for example, 
or something else. So they fly around, they have wings. How can I fly? I don't have wings. So, you know, you can you can argue that point. But otherwise, that's why there's a reason that the, the prophets and the messengers were sent as, as men. All of them were men, of course. Um, the ayat also gives the proof of the shahadatan, as we said, or shahadatan. And uh, this uh, tawheed, which Rasulullah brought to the Quraysh, was uluhiyya, tawheed uluhiyya. Tawheed rububiyya, they were quite clear. Uh, as far as Sifat, yes, they had some issues, of course. But uh, uluhiyya was a major issue, major issue. Nah? So he spent 13 years of his life in Makkah. Kulu la ilaha illallah wa tuflihu. Say la ilaha illallah and you will be and you will be prospering. You will prosper. You will be successful. Only la ilaha illallah, which is uluhiyya. But today, subhanallah, brothers and sisters, look around the Muslim world. We have Muslims or so-called Muslims who have issues in Rububiyya as well. So, you know, it's, it's fair to say that we today as Muslims, we are worse off than the Quraysh. We are worse than Abu Jahl and Abu uh, Lahab and so on and so forth. Because for them, their Rububiyya was fine. Rububiyya, sorry, the Rububiyya was fine. But today, when a person, a Muslim or a Muslima, uh, she wants to get married or he wants to get married or they want a job or, or, or uh, I don't know, increase in salary or health issues, they want to be cured of something. Where do they go? They go to the graves. And they ask the graves, to the person dead, buried in that grave to, to, to cure them, to heal them, to give them a job, to give them a child, to, have, to get them married. This is a major issue in Rububiya. You're believing that that person is going to give you a job, or that person dead in the grave is going to help you in any, any way, way and form. We talked about this in, in great length, of course, in the earlier chapters, initial few chapters of the book. Now, but the point is, you know, I just wanted to highlight that this uh, ayat and, and is evidence of the shahada, and the shahada itself is, is um, primarily uluhiya. Now, so say, and this say comes in so many places in the Quran. to name a few. And even within within the, the chapters, you will find this uh, this kalima uh, mentioned in so many places. Qul is fal amr is a verb of command in the Arabic language, and it is directed to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because the Quran was revealed to him, not to you and me. But because we are followers of Rasulullah, they apply, it applies to us as well. So when Allah says in the Zayat, for example, Kul innama ana Say, Ya Muhammad. That's in you know, parenthesis, but that's what it means. That's what it implies. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is commanding Rasulullah to tell you and me. So Rasulullah's job, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was only to convey the message. As is a daya's job. But what is more, Yani, what is more important for, for, for a daya and even for even the way of Rasulullah is that he was practicing what he was saying. So if he tells someone to pray, he would pray himself. See, it's easier to, to, to relate to someone and to learn from someone when they themselves are practicing the same thing. I mean, all of you have been, been through school, right? So you, you all definitely have a certain, you know, favorite teachers. Uh, I hope you had at least one favorite teacher. Yeah. Uh, type. So uh, I'm sure you had favorite teachers and some teachers were not so favorite and some teachers you really detested and you you hated that class and that session of theirs. Yeah. I hope I'm in the first category. Anyway, inshallah, alhamdulillah, luckily hal. Type. So why, why would you, why would you in school, for example, or in university, in college, uh, what's the difference between these teachers? If I ask you, you know, why did you prefer some over the others? They're all human beings. They're all uh, yani teaching. Uh, they're all uh, whatever, maybe men or women, whatever the case may be. But why? How come you prefer some over the others? Because you kind of relate to this person in their the way of teaching, and you think they're being sincere, yeah. And this sincerity comes through uh, practicing what you preach. Practicing what you preach. So if, if a person uh, uh, is telling you something about Islam, for example, and he, mashallah, he looks nice, he, he, he looks like a practicing Muslim, uh, you see, 
you see him to be a good role model, it's easier for you to follow what he says and to like what he says and to, and to, and to implement what he says. So Rasulullah says, though he was only conveying the message, but like Aisha says in the, in the, in the hadith of our mumin and our mother, عن, when she was asked about uh, Rasulullah's character, she said, haven't you read the Quran? And the Sahaba said, yes, ya um al -Mumineen. And this happened after the death of Rasulullah. She said, he was the walking Quran. He was the manifestation of the Quran. So it's not that you're saying something and doing something else. Audhu Billah, no. That is why we said in, in Dawah, in the field of Dawah, uh, practicing Islam, your, your job is half, half done. You, 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 you've done the Dawah, half is done already. Alhamdulillah. And people will come and ask you. You don't have to go looking for Hindus and Christians to make Dawah. They will come and ask you questions. Because now they see you as a practicing Muslim. And they have these things in their mind, these questions bugging them and bothering in their mind. They don't know exactly whom to, whom to get in touch with. So we said this acceptance of deeds, any, any deed, not only the five pillars of Islam, any action which you do. For example, Rasulullah says, Salah in the hadith, um, putting a, a morsel of, of, of food in your wife's mouth is sadaqah. So how many, how many of us do that? Raise your hands. Okay, time. Don't raise your hands. Um, but the point is, that's sadaka. That's sadaka. So the sadaka is an act of worship. And that's an act. That's a, that's a, that's now an act of worship which you want Allah to accept. So if you want Allah to accept, what what is the condition? The same two conditions. You do it sincerely. So when you're putting the morsel of food in your wife's mouth, or you're putting food on the table, whatever be the case. You have that iniya, that, that ikhlas that I'm doing for the sake of Allah and I'm doing it in the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And that can apply to anything. Wearing your garment in the morning, going to bed, uh, going into the hammam, leaving the hammam, anything. All these can be automatically converted into acts of worship just by a small change in the intention, in the niya. So our riya, which the, which the, scholar, which the sheikh is talking about in this uh, chapter, is to uh, show off. It means to show off in this type of shirk. Now, as we'll see. It's defined as performance of a deed with the intention of pleasing other than Allah. Which brings us back to the point we talked about earlier in my other previous chapters. That there are acts of worship of the heart. Loving Allah, fearing Allah, wanting to please Allah as in this case. This is an act of worship, but of the heart. But because of our iman, is of the heart and of the tongue and of the body or body organs or body limbs, that act of worship in the heart should automatically manifest, automatically translate into what we speak and what we do. Otherwise, we are lying. We, we do not want to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You see? So Riyah in, in basic, uh, fundamentally, it means uh, doing a deed with the intention of pleasing other than Allah. So showing off in front of people, whoever it may be, nah? to favorably impress people, all similar kind of meanings, right? Get into the good books, for example, yeah? So for example, uh, you know your manager is uh, a practicing Muslim, inshallah, huh? and you see him praying five times a day and he prays in the office, in the masjid, in the office, for example, or in the musalla. Huh? So you make it a point not you yourself, I'm saying, but just for example, the, the Muslim makes it a point to uh, be be in, in, in the Jamaat when his manager is praying. Because he wants his manager to see him. Oh, mashallah. You see, this guy is good. So you see? And subhanAllah, this happens with me, really. Wallahi. <laughs> On the lighter side, yani. many times I meet people whom I know, I'm, I'm not talking about strangers, people I know. Uh, but when they meet me, uh, and they sit with me and they talk to me for some reason they talk only the deen okay but otherwise I know for sure I, I know for a fact that these people brothers now nah, uh, maybe they, they, they like talking football they like talking cricket they like talking movies they like talking politics but when they sit with me it's deen I'm, it's good I'm, I'm not saying it's something bad but I'm just going to give you an example yeah that these things happen so this, this Muslim is going to be in the first saf when his manager is praying. Because his niya is what? To impress his manager. Because the manager is a practicing Muslim 
And maybe if he looks at this employee as a practicing Muslim, he's going to be pleased with him. He's going to be favorably impressed with him. And maybe he's going to give him a raise, get into his good books and so on and so forth. This is a riyah. The whole salah is gone, of course, but this is a riyah. Examples. I want to hear from you. Now, do you have any examples of riyah? Not necessarily any personal examples, any example. Yeah. Of course, don't give me personal examples, but any, any, anything which comes to mind, which you think um, could constitute as, or what could be termed as a riyah. Now, <clears throat> the brothers can use the microphones, huh? Fadalia, Muhammad Riyaz Khan, Samir. Examples of Riyah. I give you one example. Fadalia, Muhammad Riyaz. Uh, one example. Not, not the Imam, if somebody else uh, reciting uh, uh, the Salah, uh, there are times when they uh, beautify it and then recite, I mean, uh, uh, more eliquently. Uh, okay. You know, I, mean, uh, their inten I mean, intention is good, but there is a few, you know, uh, for example, if uh, the, I, I don't know if any, anybody from their place is there, you know, they, they try to read loud and those kind of things. No, no, no. A good example, yes. Um, and we'll discuss this also. I have a point on this. I want it's coming up. But yeah, good example. Somebody uh, beautifying his voice. But see, as a person, this is one point in Ria, right? Because it's something in the heart, really. Because somebody else, so if, if, if a person, Abdullah, is doing this, or even the other example I talked about of the manager, and I am watching him, I have no idea. I have no clue whether he's being sincere or insincere. I have no idea of finding it out. It's between him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is why we say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what is in your hearts. He knows what you're thinking, even before you think it. Now, so, this case of Abdullah reciting eloquently or his beautifying his voice in the Quran, of course, we're supposed to beautify the speech of Allah as we recite it. This is something which is recommended. But I, as a person watching this, for example, will not know. I will have no idea whether this is the riyah or he is, it is uh, full of ikhlas. I have no clue. So it is between that person, Abdullah, in this example, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, further, yes. Anybody else has any other example? No? Like, let's move on then, inshallah. But of course, there are so many examples like this. Now, uh, but the point I want to highlight, I'm not sure it's coming up. Uh, okay, let me do it now before I forget. Um, no, it's coming, it's coming. Uh, yeah, I remember it's coming. Okay, uh, the next, uh, or the, 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 the first hadith which the Sheikh brings in this uh, chapter, after the first ayat is a marfu hadith. What is marfu? Ah, it was also an exam question for you, I think. What is marfu hadith? You know, there is sahih hadith, there is daif, there is uh, maudu, there is uh, hasan, there is, uh, you know, different types of gradations or, or, or gradings of uh, hadith. So what is marfu? Ah, brothers and sisters, what is marfu hadith? Okay, somebody said giving sadaqah to show off. Now, now, yes, the giving sadaqah to show off is also an act of, of riyah because sadaqah is an act of worship. If you do it uh, so somebody is watching you and he, he wants to show that person I'm giving a lot of money as sadaqah, yeah, this becomes uh, yeah, riyah. And it's very difficult, really. Because sometimes shaitan comes to you. You're giving sadaqah, maybe sincerely, but shaitan comes and whispers, oh, you're trying to show off. What do you do in this case? You get the point? So for example, uh, even the recitation of the Quran, I'm reciting eloquently, hopefully, inshallah, and um, shaitan comes and whispers and he says, ah, Abu Basim, you're trying to show off. You're trying to get, you're getting into Riyadh now. Because shaitan wants you to stop doing that. He wants you to stop that beautiful recitation. He wants you to stop giving sadaqah. You get the point? So the scholars say you fight this. You, 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 you fight that thought if you say istiada, that's fine, Audhu Bilam and Shaitan and Rajim, and so on, and continue with your good deed, inshallah, and then Shaitan is, is driven away. Now, Tay, Marfu, Fadal, ya. Brother Samir, Fadal. Uh, Marfu is like, uh, it's attributed to uh, our Prophet Muhammad, 
and narrated by one of, by one of his sahabis companions na na jazakallah khair so marfu hadith is is something which is pro- attributed to rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the first person in the chain in the sanad is a sahabi of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam so in this hadith uh, marfu from abu huraira radhiyallahu an uh, that allah said i am most independent so when we say allah said what kind of hadith is this Uh, the hadith is saying Allah said, and you will see many hadith like this, uh, where, where Rasulullah would say Allah said. You know, what 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 do you call this? There's a term for this. Anyone knows? Qudsi, Qudsi, hadith Qudsi. Yeah, hadith Qudsi is what we call this now. Because see, see, the difference between Quran and Hadith is what basically, Quran is is the is the speech and the meaning of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Whereas uh, Hadith generally is is the meaning from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, but the speech of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Quran, if you recite it, there is a reward. Hadith, if you recite it, there is no reward. You get the point? And there could be other differences, but the primary difference is that. But Hadith has a special category called Hadith Qudsi. Like this hadith, in which case the speech and meaning is from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So Rasulullah is directly telling you exactly what Allah inspired to him through Jibril Alayhi Salam. Like in this case, Allah said, "I am most independent and free from from anybody or needing associates. Whoever performs a deed while associating partners with me, I will leave him, along with his setting up of associates with me." So the, the the hadith is is a grave warning that when you perform a deed or an act of worship uh, for someone else, that is associate partner to someone else, if you're doing it for somebody else, somebody else, Allah will leave that person, and this is a sure destruction. And if Allah leaves the person, mushkila, big problem, right? Because without Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, we, we cannot exist. We cannot do anything without Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So this is a hadith Qudsi, like we said. Now, and uh, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala does not accept any deed that includes shirk, and arriya is a type of shirk. Confirmation of Allah's divine attributes of a complete independence from all partners. Also, the ayat in Surah Ikhlas, "Kul hum Allahu ahad, Allahu samad, lam yadid wa lam yulad wa lam yakul lahu kufwan ahad." Samad is, is, is not requiring anybody. He's independent of anyone. Self-sufficient. Yeah, that's a good meaning as well for us, Samad. Uh, Allah does not accept deeds except that they are done solely for his sake. It's very, very important. Even these classes, brothers and sisters, when you log on to Zoom and join, to listen to what I'm saying, nah, you, need to, you need to correct your intention. It's very important. You need to correct your intention. Would you spend like one one and a half hours with me, listening me to listening me to going on blah blah blah? Yeah, but the point is your intention. If you want to, ha- if you ha- if you want this time of an hour and a half to be rewarded by Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, the intention, the niyyah is very important. Also, Allah's divine attribute of speech, because here the Hadith could see Allah said, right? Abu Hurairah said Allah said. So this is a divine attribute of confirmation of of uh, the attribute of speech. And the importance of one's knee and all matters, like we said, even the garment which you wear in the morning, a normal routine activity. Every day we wear, we wear clothes, we wear outfits, we wear garments. When you go to work, we, uh, when we have a bath, whatever, even that small act can become become an act of worship. If you have the intention to please Allah, and you recite the dua for wearing a garment, for example, likewise going to bed in the night. All of us sleep at night, so when you go to bed in the night, if you have the intention. If you are going to sleep because you want to recharge your battery so you can get up for Fajr or for the Hajj in the early morning, now uh, to please Allah, now and of course this is the way of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. You would get up uh, the last third of the night, so you're getting rewarded for every second that you sleep. Even though you're sleeping, even though you're not in control of your uh, body, even though your soul is taken out, you're still being rewarded. This is the importance of niyyah. Now, 
Now, the point which the brother mentioned in the example of the recitation of the Quran, I just wanted to explain a bit more on that point with this uh, important note, that when the intention behind a deed is to please Allah, but after making this intention, a person was guilty of riya. So shaitan comes to him and he falls uh, and he starts to whisper to him to make to do to do, to show off. But this person then rejected it. He fought shaitan and rejected it. His deed would be acceptable. Now, this is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That, you know, though you started off with, with, with a class, but midway through the deed or halfway through the deed, whatever, shaitan comes to you and you fight this. Like the example I gave, uh, I think many classes back, a person is praying in the masjid. Naam, and, and he starts off with, with the right niyyah and the intention is there and the class is there. And then as he's going to go into sajda, he sees his manager walking to pray as well. So again, like the example, he wants to impress his manager. He prolongs, he elongates his, his sujood. MashaAllah, this guy, you know, making so much dua in, in prostration. In this case, the whole salah is gone. But if shaitan comes to him and whispers to him and he sees the manager from the corner of the eye and he says, oh, you've got to elongate your sajda now. You need to make it longer. But the brother realizes this, this shaitan and he fights this whispers and he continues his salah as, as normal. The salah is acceptable. You get the point? But if this brother continued to be guilty of reya, so he continued falling to, to shaitan's trap and he elongated his sajda or whatever, now, until he finished his deed, the complete, and he made even his qiyam long, maybe, for example. Then according to some scholars, and this is the more stronger opinion, wallahu alam, the whole deed is gone. It's, it's in vain. It's batil. Well, others said it is still acceptable because his original intention was for the sake of Allah. When he started his salah, for example. Wallahu alam. But um, we feel that the first opinion is more stronger, that the whole salah is gone. So it's very important to focus in salah. You know, you want to go even before you start, and even when you enter the masjid, you should expect, you should already expect shaitan to be bothering you. So it should, it should not come as a surprise to you. You should expect that. Because once you expect that, you're prepared now. Ah. So once you know your enemy, and once you know what he can do to you, and you know this from the Quran and the Sunnah, you have now the weapons to fight him. It's the other. You focus on Auz Billahi Minish Shaitan Nirrajim. Every word you focus on this and you mean it when you say it. And then you will see the difference. Now, um, so the whole, because the deed in this case is Salah, it starts with Takbir al ihram and ends with uh, Taslim. This is one act of worship. You can't subdivide it, right? It's one act of worship. So because in the middle somewhere this person gave what is due only to Allah, to Gairullah, in this case the manager, the whole salah is gone. It is one act of worship. But the other example which I gave also earlier, and I like to give this example, Sadaqah. Somebody mentioned Sadaqah. So Sadaqah, you come out of the masjid, you see somebody asking, huh? and you give him for the sake of Allah, 10 riyals. And then you want to move on. You see another person asking. And now you see again the manager coming out of the masjid. You give him 50 riyals now. Because you want to show off to your manager. Maybe you also hold up the note so that he can see it. Oh, it's 50, 50 bill, 50 dollar or 50 riyals bill, yeah. And you give it to him. So in this case, the second is not accepted. Even though it is more in terms of money, in terms of the amount of money. But the first is accepted. Because each is a different unit of act of worship which you did. The, the first sadaqah is different, the second sadaqah is different. They're not related to each other. The first is accepted, but the second is not accepted. But in terms of salah, because it's one act of worship, the whole thing is gone. See? The second hadith the Shaykh brings, brings is uh, in Mustad Ahmad. Ahmad reported the following, also a marfu hadith from Abu, Abu Sayyid al-Qudri radiallahu an that the Prophet wasallam said, shall I not tell you what I fear for you more than the false Messiah? Companions, 
asked, indeed, O Messenger of Allah, he said, it is hidden shirk. As when a person beautifies his salah, when he knows that others are watching. Ibn Majah as well and Muslim Muhammad. Uh, what is false messiah? Who knows? I'm sure all of you know, but this too. What is false messiah? Hmm. What is what is the Prophet referring to here when he says, Shall I not tell you what I fear for you more than the false Messiah? Huh? False messenger. Who is this false messenger? Who is the false messenger? Messenger, not messenger, really. No, no. Not messenger, sorry. Wrong answer. False Messiah is who? Who's the false Messiah? Nobody knows? Strange. The Dajjal, nah, the Dajjal. Nah, nah. See, the Dajjal was not a messenger. No, no. The Dajjal, he claimed to be God. He claimed to be Allah. So it's not a messenger anymore. He's way beyond that. Yani. He claimed to be Allah himself. Masiha, Masiha Dajjal, you say in Arabic, right? Masiha Dajjal. Masiha, Mas. Uh, masa is to, is to wipe, to anoint or to wipe. You, you do masa of your socks, right? When you make wudu, it's allowed to make uh, masa of your socks, provided you put them on in, in wudu and so on, the certain conditions, right? But you can wipe, you can make masa of socks. So he's called uh, Masiha Dajjal because one of his eyes is wiped out. He has only one eye. And Allah says, Rasulullah says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and your rub is not one eyed. Excuse me. So, uh, also we say Isa ibn Maryam. For Isa also we call him the Messiah. Because the same word, Masa, wiping. Because he would wipe and anoint when he would, uh, by the will of Allah, of course, uh, heal, heal the, the lepers and, and cure them by wiping over them. They would become okay, perfectly fine. Isa alayhi salam. So this word is used for both of them. Subhanallah. So, what I fear for you more than Masih al-Dajjal is what? Hidden shirk. And Rasulullah explained that in this hadith. When he, what he meant by hidden shirk, which is riya. A riya is hidden shirk. It's hidden shirk because it, it creeps up upon you, like Rasulullah said in another hadith, sallallahu alayhi wa it creeps up, 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 upon you without your knowledge, without you knowing it, like a black ant creeping on a black knock or a rock on a dark night. A black ant creeping on a, on, on a, a black rock on a dark night. So it's pitch dark. The rock is black. You can't see it. The ant is black. You can't see it. This is how a riya gets into you. Without even knowing, without even you knowing it. Which, is, which means what? Which means as Muslims, we need to keep our defenses up always, always. Always keep this thing of niya in your mind. Always. Whatever you do, wherever you go, whatever you want to start... Always keep Nia in your mind. With how it creeps. That's why it's called hidden shirk. And that's what I explain this is an example in this hadith. When the pure person beautifies his salat, when he knows that others are watching. So now he's given something which is only due to Allah to someone else. Shirk. So the hadith uh, explains to us or gives us the, 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 the understanding of the amount of concern our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had for us. Any brothers and sisters, if you look at the seerah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and inshallah, may Allah may make it easy for me and for you. I want to start seerah once, you know, I have the opportunity, inshallah. May dua, inshallah. Hopefully, we want to start seerah in detail, in detail. Because I do seerah for one of the institutes here, but it's, it's very... It's an abstract version. Yeah. It's not at all doing justice to the seerah. But I want to do it in detail over many sessions. Like Kitab al -Tawheed. So you will see when you study seerah that each and everything with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa did was for us. Wallahi, nobody will do anything like this. Even your own parents. That is why you have to love him more than your parents. Anything, every, anything you take off from his life. 
you will find that behind it was concern for the ummah behind it was benefit for the ummah behind it was something he wanted to pass on to the ummah for, for them to prosper for them to get into jannah and he subhanallah when abdullah bin ubay bin saul the chief munafiq hypocrite known guaranteed that by based revelation he had died Rasulullah wanted to pray janaza over him. Allah Akbar. Can you can you can you imagine that? I mean, this person is the enemy of Allah. He's the enemy of Islam. He did so many things to destroy Islam in Medina. And yet, our messenger was standing to start salah on him. Salat al janaza. What is salat? Salat al janaza not a small thing, brothers and sisters. Especially when the messenger salah is the Imam. Because Salat al-Janazah, what, what is this basically, fundamentally? Fundamentally, it is making dua of forgiveness for that dead person. You're asking Allah to forgive that dead person. That is the fundamental premise. And imagine if the messenger of Allah is the Imam. SubhanAllah. So, and there are various, hadith, various instances, but this hadith uh, also details the concern Rasulullah had for us. He warned us about Dajjal, he warned us about hidden shirk. Because he didn't want us to fall into these things or have these issues. And then the evidence is that, that this arriya, this uh, hidden shirk is greater of a danger to the ummah than Dajjal. Because Dajjal, uh, he still has some fears for us, more than, for, the, more, for us the Dajjal, but more than this, yeah, because another hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the thing I fear for you most is the fitna of the child. And he said, no prophet was sent by Allah, but he warned his people of the child. Because the child, we do not know when he will emerge. And Rasulullah said another hadith, that if the child comes out in my time, I will be sufficient uh, for him, that I will protect you from him. But if he comes after I uh, depart or after I die, each one of you is, is on your own. So this fitna is very, very dangerous. And this person is an actual being. Because some, yani, I don't want to name the people, but some so-called duat and scholars, not even scholars, I don't know, not a scholar, not a scholar, definitely. Um, they say in, in the Dajjal refers to uh, the dollars. It refers to, I don't know, uh, COVID, it refers to something else, it refers to symbolizing it. This is nonsense because we have many ahadith, sahih, about Dajjal clearly referring to him, uh, referring him to be uh, the son of Adam, a human being. Yeah. But a special, uh, uh, what shall we say, special, uh, give me the right word for it. Allah, Allah, Allah gave him certain things. Huh? As, as, a, as a test for you and me. So we need to also inform our children about the Dajjal. Because maybe he will come out when we are dead and gone. We don't want our children left, uh, you know, directionless or without any guidance or having no knowledge about the Dajjal and not knowing. Because we need to preempt him. We need to be, because Rasulullah said, if you don't have Iman before the Dajjal appears, then it will do you no good. Which means after he, after he appears, you know, you cannot get Iman. I mean, you're, you're, you're gone. I mean, it's, it's very difficult. The fitna and the trial is so, so huge. So you need to have the firm Iman before that. So we need to tell our children and teach our children about the Dajjal so that they can be prepared. There's so many ahadith in the books of hadith. Now, and we also talked about it in my series and on uh, on the playlist you will find uh, Akhirah. We talked about uh, the the, the the akhira we had a section on on the minor signs of the day of judgment then the major signs of the day of judgment so dajjal is a major sign of the day of judgment so we talked about him in great detail we brought all the hadith and all the ayat about dajjal you can look it up inshallah it's on the uh, youtube channel so it's a great danger scholar said for in this case with, with respect to riyah because dajjal we know comes at a, in a particular period of time this is this is confirmed or really confined sorry to a particular time period but Arriya can be any time to anybody, anywhere, any generation. You get the point? So it's more of, of, of an issue, really. Also, the hadith, as Rasulullah used a question 
to teach, right? He asked them, you, shall I tell you something more uh, serious than the, than the fitna of the jal? So immediately it, 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 he got their attention. Immediately, immediately the Sahaba are now paying rapt attention because of the of the style of teaching, the style of questioning. Yeah. So that's a, that's a good thing to do, inshallah. So Rasulullah said hidden shirk. Because one's work appears to be rewarded to Allah, although it is intended for other than him. So like we said earlier, at the face of it, I don't know whether this recitation this brother is doing is with ikhlas or for riya. We have no idea. So it appears it is for the sake of Allah. But actually we don't know. That's why it's hidden. There's, there's, there's something underlying it, subliminally, you know, the, it's giving giving it to someone else other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Rasulullah used the word hidden, uh, with, with the word shirk. And we defend you, Prophet, Muhammad means it to make it longer, to make it uh, like we said, to perform, perform it perfectly. Uh, of course, we need to do all of this for the sake of Allah alone. Now, then it, that's, that is when it is rewarded. Right? So these were the two ahadith which the Sheikh brings in this chapter. The next chapter is chapter 37 where uh, the Sheikh titles it. It again goes in, in kind of nicely uh, maps or gels into the previous chapter. Doing righteous deeds for worldly gain. So, you're doing righteous deeds, but for something in dunya. dunya, dunya. So, for something in dunya, want something in dunya out of this. Similar, similar. It's of course like like Ria, definitely, and and you're looking for some object uh, benefit in in dunya. So, in this chapter, the first ayat, <coughs> excuse me. With the Sheikh uh, brings actually two ayat in one um, section from uh, Surah Hud 15 and 16, where Allah says, Man ayat dunya wa ilayhim fiha wa hum fiha la yubkhasun. Lahum fil nar wa ma sanau fiha wa ma kanu yahmadun. Whoever desires life of this dunya, makana viridul hayat dunya of this life, this dunya, and its glitter, its adornment, it what it offers, its riches, its wealth, zinataha, so all that. Uh, and there, um, uh, where am I? Okay, its glitter. To them we shall pay in full their deeds therein. fiha. So you will get what you wanted in dunya. fiha la yubhasun, and they will have no decrease there. Nothing will be decreased for them. Whatever they des <coughs> excuse me deserved uh, for what they wanted uh, in dunya, they will get it. Whoever desires desires life of this world and its glitter, to to them we shall pay in full their deeds there in the dunya itself, and they will have no decrease there. Nothing, no injustice will be will be done to them because Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Is Al Adl, Al Adl, the most just. The next ayat he says, Subhanahu wa Taala, Ulaik al Ladina, Laisa lahum fil Akhira. They are those for whom there is nothing in the Akhira. Ilan na, except the fire. Wa Habita, and then ayat continues, and vain are the deeds they did therein in dunya, and of no effect is that they which they used to do. Na. So, so is it wrong? Okay, before we get into the benefits of the ayat and what the, the Sheikh and the commentators talk about it, because ayat says, whoever desires whoever desires life of this world. So is it wrong? The soal I'm asking you. Is this is it wrong to desire the life of this dunya? Huh? I wanted to pass participate. Since last class, I made it a bit more. Last session, uh, if you join, I want you also to, you know, not just have a, keep having lunch as you're listening, but to also participate with me now, uh, inshallah. So, Fadal, so what what is, uh, so is it wrong? Is it wrong to desire the life of this world? 
tough question, huh? Or tricky question rather. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to this. Why do you think it, it's going to come, inshallah? So we'll, we'll come back to this question. So the benefits of this ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may reward even the disbeliever for his deeds in this world. Because see, he is a slave, he, he is, uh, yani, uh, everyone, everyone in this dunya, past and present and future, of course, are slaves of Allah. Some acknowledge it, like yourselves, and you practice Islam, inshallah, and some reject it. And they become slaves of other things. But in fact, they're all slaves of Allah. And when Allah puts something in dunya for a period of time, He gives them whatever he, they deserve. But dunya itself, in the eyes of Allah, is nothing. Zilch, kaput, zero. Nothing. Because you have the other hadith of Rasulullah which He said, if this world, you know, the whole world with its riches and its gold and the palaces and the diamonds and the jewels, everything, everything. If this world was worth in the eyes of Allah, even a, the, uh, the wing of a mosquito, one wing of a mosquito, you know, mosquito, the small things which keep irritating us and buzzing around our ears. Yeah. And they have uh, wings on either side. So just one wing, one wing. If this whole world was worth even a wing of a mosquito, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not give the kuffar a glass of water to drink. You get the point? So, this dunya is, is, is worthless. Dunya, subhanallah, dunya, the word itself in Arabic language, it's an Arabic word. It means something at the bottom, something very low. Subhanallah. But we raise it. We, we give it more than what it deserves. So for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this dunya is nothing, not even, not even the wing of a mosquito. Because if it was something, he would not give the kuffar even a drink of water to drink, but he gives them everything. The kuffar are very rich. Some of them are millionaires, multi-billionaires. Someone, someone was telling me the other day, um, this guy, because it's football season, this guy, uh, what's his name, Messi, huh? who's messed up according to me, but anyway, I know maybe, maybe you lot like that covered if you like it. But anyway, the point is that he's a kafir, right? And you, it's, it's not a lot for a Muslim to like a kafir. Type. So this person, he makes uh, what? Uh, some amount, I forgot I forgot the amount. They told me uh, per day, he makes like, I don't know, $450,000 or something. Some thousands of dollars in one day. I probably made that in my lifetime. He makes it in one day. Who's giving him this? Who gave him those uh, skills of mastery with the football? Who gave him all those sponsorships and those clubs and uh, what money he gets? Who, who gave him that beautiful family he has? Who gave him those riches and the cars he drives and the palaces and the villas he owns across the world? Who gave him all of that? Who gave him those business class tickets which he uses to fly around the world? Who gave him that? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And yet he rejects him. He tells, he, he claims Allah has a son. A'udhu billah. A'udhu billah. How can we like such a person? Who tells that our Rabb has a son. We just saw a samad. Qul huwa Allahu ahad. Allah is samad. So we need to put as Muslims, see brothers and sisters, the reason we're learning Tawheed is to put things in perspective. Don't fall for the, the traps of, 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 of the media and of the world and what people say, including other Muslims. Because they don't know, they don't have knowledge. But you are better than them. You have this knowledge now. So put things in perspective. Don't be floored by his uh, goal kick or kick from middle of the court to the end, middle of the ground to the end, right into the you know, um, goal post or the, his penalty kick. Don't get fooled. If he's a Muslim, Alhamdulillah, we, 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 we would support him. But this guy says, Allah has a son. Can you imagine that? This is Tawheed. We're studying Tawheed. So, coming back to the point that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the disbelievers what they deserve in dunya. Because in the Akhirah, they have nothing. As we saw in the Ayat, they have nothing in the Akhirah. As he might reward the one who acts excuse me, for worldly gain, but none of them will have anything in the hereafter. So Muslims' focus should be Akhirah. 
the Muslims focus should be Akhra. But again, is it wrong to, to, to desire dunya? Not necessarily, but as long as there's a there are, there are conditions to it. There are, uh, you know, conditions to it. As long as your intention is to use dunya for Akhra, then it's okay. Not dunya for dunya. You see the point? There's a big difference. If I desire dunya for dunya is something else. And if I desire dunya for the akhirah, I want to I want to invest in the akhirah. That's something totally different. Huge difference between the two. The first is not rewarded at all. You get only the reward in dunya. The second, inshallah, there is a reward in the akhirah. As with Abu Bakr Siddiq, Uthman ibn Affan, uh, Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, Sahaba radiallahu anhum of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Filthy rich. Abu Bakr used to use his money to sleep, free slaves. Left, right and center. Uthman would, would buy and sell and, and make a profit and then give it completely fi sabirillah, completely. Once he denoted 100 camels in one of the battles. And each camel is very expensive. So, desiring dunya for akhira is okay. It's okay, fine. But that should be your intention. It's very difficult to have that intention, brothers and sisters. You may start off right, but you know, shaitan comes to you. Now, and shirk invalidates good deeds. Uh, because the ayat we saw, <laughs> sorry, I got for the ayat itself. Yes, okay, I'm just reminding myself. Now, uh, so if you desire something other to, to please other than Allah or, or, to, or to get into shirk, it destroys your good deeds. And seeking the life of this world invalidates good deeds in the hereafter. See, good deeds in dunya is fine. It's okay. It's a bonus. But our focus is, is, is that we want our amal to matter for us in akhirah. When, when the mizan, the, the scale is set up, the scale of the obeying of the deeds, the right pan and the left pan, that is when our amal will matter. That is when we will say, Ya Laitan, if I had done something else, if I had done just one smile, one one sadaka, one small sadaka, one more umrah, one more hajj, one more fast, one more qiyam al layl, one more salah, if I had prayed, if only I had prayed. If, 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 if. No amount of ifs will change reality at that point in time, brothers and sisters. And we ask Allah to, to, to bless our deeds and to accept our deeds. There's no point, no much, no, no, no matter how much I shout here in front of this microphone, if Allah doesn't accept it, I'm wasting my time. So you want Allah to accept our deeds. You want Allah to make us better practicing Muslims. Um, okay, politism renders one's good deeds wide. So they're rendered wide and they have nothing if they're done for dunya. And Muslims are warned not to seek after any worldly gain by deeds supposedly intended for the sake of Allah. So don't use, um, like, you know, someone gives a large, large amount of money in charity and then he announces it in public to show off. That's what point six is about, right? So you're destroying the whole charity money which you have given. <clears throat> Muslims are urged to intend by the deeds the reward of Allah in the hereafter. So anytime you do a good deed, anything, always your focus is the akhir. Always the focus is akhir. Okay. Uh, apologies for this huge content here, but let me read it because it's a very, very important hadith. It goes with what we're talking about in the sense that it's not in the book. Uh, it's it's uh, added separately. But uh, it goes in, in line with doing deeds for showing off, doing deeds for worldly gain and so on. On the authority of, let me read it for you slowly, so just follow the audio. On the authority of Abu Huraira radiallahu an, who said, I heard the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa say, the first of people against whom judgment will be pronounced on the day of resurrection will be a man who died as a martyr, shaheed. He will be brought and Allah will make known to him his favors. And he will recognize them. Then Allah will say, and what did you do about them? So he's a shaheed. So Allah will remind him that I made you strong. I made you gallant and brave and so on. So what did you do about them? So this person will say, I fought for you until I died as a shaheed. 
Allah will say, you have lied. You did, but fight that it might be said of you, he is courageous. So Allah will say, Khadabat, you, you lie. You did fight, you did this and you fight, fought this way because people should call you courageous, he is courageous. And so it was said. They said this. Then he will be ordered to be dragged along on his face until he is cast into hellfire. Another man will be brought who has studied the Quran and knowledge and so on and, and has taught it. And he used to recite the Quran. He will be brought and Allah will make known to him his favors and he will recognize them. He will acknowledge them. Allah will say, and what did you do about them? He will say, I studied religious knowledge and I taught it and he recite, recited the Quran for your sake, O oh Allah. Allah will say, you have lied. but You lied. You did but study religious knowledge that it might be said of you, he is learned. He is mashallah alim, he is a sheikh, mashallah, he is learned. And you recited the Quran, that may, said, that it may be said of you, he is a reciter. He is mashallah, fantastic reciter. And so it was said in dunya, it was said, you got this in dunya already. Then you'll be ordered to be dragged along his face until he's thrown into hellfire. Another man will be brought whom Allah had made rich and to whom he had given all kinds of wealth. He'll be brought and Allah will make known to him his favors and he will say, and he will recognize them, sorry, recognize them. Allah will say, and what did you do about them? He will say, I left no path in which you like money to be spent without spending it for your sake. So I, I, every, every path possible, I spent money for your sake. Oh Allah. Allah will say, you have lied. You did, but do so that it might be said of you, he is open-handed. He is generous. He is, mashallah, giving left, right and center. And so it was said. People said this in dunya. Then he'll be ordered to be dragged along his face and cast into hellfire. Sahih Muslim, Mutirmidi, Wa Nasaya and also in uh, the Arbain Hadith Qudsi. Very, very dangerous Hadith, brothers and sisters. Going back to the, the, the chapter title that, you know, you do something for dunya and you will get what what you desire in, in dunya itself. As in these three examples, and these are the first people to be thrown into hellfire. Before the hypocrites, before the uh, kuffar, the first ones to be thrown into hellfire. And amazing yani, uh, actions or acts, uh, one is a martyr, one is a recipient of the Quran, knowledge, alim, sheikh, and one is uh, giving sadaqa, zakat, left, right, and center. But they did it for dunya. And they got what they wanted in dunya. They wanted people to call them courageous. They wanted, and they were called courageous. They wanted people to call them learned. They were called learned and sheikh and alim and mashallah, this and that. They wanted people to call them open handed. And they were called that generous and this and that. So in akhirah, what are you asking for? Allah says. You wanted that in dunya, you got it. I gave it to you in dunya. Because you wanted dunya, you got it. And who gave that those terms to them in dunya? It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So why are you asking anything from me now here? Is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is questioning. And they are dry, dragged by their faces and thrown into hell. So if you do something for the sake of Allah, now yes, you have the right to, to ask of this and to benefit from this and to expect a reward inshallah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But when you do something for dunya, and that you get that in dunya, how can you expect something for, for that in akhirah? This is shirk. You the point, brothers and sisters. So very important hadith. I want you to always keep this in mind. Always keep this in mind. Whenever you start something in action, a deed, uh, even when you're giving your own lectures and tars, uh, you start off with a class. Talk, tell, tell the brothers and sisters about sincerity in the deen. Now, Okay, <clears throat> seeking life of this world through righteous deeds. There are three categories. So, like we said, is it is it haram? It is not. Is it not allowed to seek anything of dunya? Right. There are three categories: to perform deeds purely for the sake of Allah, but with the hope that Allah will reward one for them in this life, such as the person who gives charity, hoping that Allah will protect him from loss, and this is prohibited. Number two. To perform deeds in order to be seen by the people, ar or to be heard by them, as -suma. This is a form of shirk. And finally, to do good deeds in order to attain some material benefit from people, such as the one who accompanies 
the pilgrims for Hajj, for example, in order to receive a payment. No reward for any deed from Allah, but gets the worldly gain. So the first uh, category is you're, you're doing something purely for the sake of Allah, but you're also hoping some reward in dunya. This is what the scholar said, this is haram. It's haram. You do it only for the sake of Allah. Right? That's, the, that's, the, that's the point. Number two, you do it to be seen by people. So there is no ikhlas anywhere in, the, in this case. You do it to be seen by people or to be heard, we talked about and so on. This is shirk. The third one, you do it purely for dunya. It's, it's, a, it's a religious act like, you know, you're, you go along with somebody in, in the hajj group. You're the leader of the hajj group, for example, or whatever, yeah? You go along with the hujjaj, with the pilgrims, to get some payment, some money. Or you're teaching Quran, you're a, te you're a, you're a qari, but you're teaching Quran to the children only to get money. This is again uh, not allowed, and you get the money, you'll get what you deserve in dunya because you wanted that. There's nothing in the akhir. The fourth category is, of course, what is, is, is only ikhlas and only for the sake of Allah. Barakallahu alaykum. Time will stop with this. Um, yes, I think we'll stop with this, inshallah. And we'll continue uh, next week, brothers and sisters. Barakallahu alaykum. Uh, we'll continue with this chapter. Any quick, any quick questions you may have uh, on this? What we covered so far? I don't see any questions in the chat box. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we, we'll continue with this next week, uh, which is seeking the life of this world. And these are some examples here on the slide. And we'll continue with that. I think two ahadith we have to cover in this chapter and then the next chapter, inshallah. Yeah, last time, let me just check the chat box. Okay. No, no, no message, no questions. Barakallahu and no hands raised. Khalas, alhamdulillah. We'll see you then, inshallah, next week. Until then, subhanak Allah, humu bihamdika, shadun la ilaha illa ant, astaghfiraka wa tubu ilayk, wa akhir dawana, and alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.